want you to turn to Matthew chapter 2 again. And we are looking again at the uh, story of the wise men. Only place in the scripture where we have anything about them, uh, as we have said before, in Matthew chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to read down and include uh, verse 8. So uh, Matthew chapter 2, we are focusing uh, distinctly on verse 7 and somewhat verse 8, but verse 7, which uh, is connected, of course, uh, with what's happening in verse 8. <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the old wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. When you found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Let's bow together in prayer. Uh, Lord, there... Uh, we're asking this morning that you would, uh, in this Christmas season and time, uh, give us the heart of the wise men, uh, the kind of determination, the kind of focus, the kind of uh, absolutism, the kind of uh, passion, the kind of endurance that would not give up until they found you. May you capture us this morning. Uh, with yourself. And Lord, we know there's a lot of tradition, there's a lot of uh, flesh, there's a lot of uh, body drives, there's a lot of materialism, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of theology, there's a lot of churchy stuff. There's just a lot of stuff to distract us. Don't let us get sidetracked from you, we pray thee. But today, we open ourselves for your voice to speak to us uh, through your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, there is no way to deal with the wise men and this story that we're dealing with without coming consistently back to the issue of seeking. Uh, I mean, even the casual reader, when you go through it, it's all about seeking. Uh, everybody in the passage is seeking except one group. And seeking seems to be the a tremendous focus. They have come, the endurance of it, um, the uh, two years of riding on a camel, uh, the financial involvement of traveling all that time. Uh, they just simply would not give up because they had come seeking. And if seeking is the issue of the passage, I would like to tell you that flows into the entirety of the message of the Scriptures. For everywhere you go in the Bible, the central issue seems to be seeking. And I want to tell you, I'm a seeker. Uh, I'm a seeker after the heart of God. I'm a seeker after Jesus. And I, I've been criticized for saying that in the past, because when you say you're seeking, that indicates to a lot of people that you haven't found anything. But the reason I'm seeking is because I have found. And the wonder of it is, the more I find Him, the more I seek Him because I discover that I've hardly scratched the surface in this whole thing of relationship with him and the hugeness of his being and the capturing that he does in the human heart is so phenomenal that it just, it just allures you. It's addictive. In fact, one of the definitions for the word slave in the New Testament, when Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, it's, it, it has an addictive flavor to it that there is something about Jesus that is so overwhelming. I'm talking about the person of Jesus now that is so overwhelming 
that it just literally wraps itself around you and draws you to himself. And that you have to resist that. You have to fight that. You have to ward that off. You have to push that aside not to follow it. Uh, see, it's not that the world is alluring me and, and I have to push that aside to get to Jesus. It's the fact that Jesus is alluring me and I have to push that aside to stay where I am and not seek. So the message of the passage, there's no question about it, is a message of seeking. Will you just plain flat roll up your sleeves and go after the person of Jesus as the wise men deed, did? In fact, when you go into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the filling idea, again, it's not I'm filled, lean back, pat my big belly, hey, I've got all I can eat. It's not that kind of filling. It's a filling that once you have experienced it, that, uh, that somehow makes you hungry for more of what you've just been filled with. It's a phenomenal idea. And it's the seeking idea. When you go to the Old Testament, God said, if you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found. And the secret seems to be wrapped up in the whole heart deal. And of course, the seeking we're talking about is not a casual seeking, not a kind of seeking, not a little seeking. It's a passionate, burning seeking. It's a, it, and, and the wise men set the standard for us because, again, it's this two-year See a star, go after this thing, will not quit, pound it, man. Wonder where you're going, wonder will it happen, yet here he comes, here they come, the wise men, they will not give up. They are, it's costing them financially, it's costing them family time, it's costing them physically, in their own physical structure, everything, but hey, they're seeking, they're seeking. That seems to be the message that he's giving us. In the passage, wouldn't it be interesting if there's one single thing that God wants out of you, only one single thing he requires, wouldn't it be something if it's just one deal, and that is that you just go after him with everything you got? <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting if there's no other requirements? If there's nothing else to do? It's just wholeheartedly, hey, everything else is going to be secondary. Everything else is going to come under the influence of this one thing. I want a relationship with this person of Jesus in my life. I'm coming after him. I want to know the depth of his heart. I want to know how he thinks. I want to know how he feels. I want to experience him. And wouldn't it be something if that's the only thing God requires? It fits the standard. And again, it's given in our passage. What could keep you from that? What would be the obstacle? What would you have to crawl over the top of to have that dominant in your life? And of course, the answer is pride. Isn't it interesting that in order to seek him, you have to have an openness, and that openness exposes you. It even shows you're wrong sometimes. Well, most of the time. But see, I've got to cover my image. <laughs> see, I've got to maintain. I don't want... But the seeking we're talking about, see, is a brokenness. It is a openness. It is a, it is a driving passion that says, hey, I don't care what who says and what they think. I care about one thing, the reality of his presence and knowing him and him alone. Wow. Now, in the passage, there's a contrast going on in the seeking. And it's very evident. For instance, if you go to verse uh, three, you will find that there is a group that's not seeking. And this is ironic and probably ought to preach a whole sermon on this, but 
Hey, it says in verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Then verse 4, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes. Now, here's the chief priests and scribes. Do you understand? These are the religious people, the height of their day. These are the most righteous people, the people that keep the law, the people that run the church, the people that got the thing going. These are the, these are the guys at the top of the, of the list. Every day, a Jew would get up in the morning, and the first words in the Jewish home that were to be spoken is, could this be the day? It was a question, and it was a question asking, could this be the day, meaning when the Messiah would be born? So every day of the year, they've been getting up, proposing the idea that would give them the focus of the day, could this be the day when the Messiah is born? Now some wise men have walked into their town and said, Woo! He's been born. He's here. Where is he? You tell us. And of course they know because they know the scriptures. So Herod and the wise men come to the temple and when they come to the scribes, the chief priests and the scribes, they go to the scriptures and say, Well, it's Bethlehem. Do you realize Bethlehem was five miles down the road? This is not like, hey, you can walk that. But these guys who've been looking for him every day of their life didn't make the trip, weren't interested. Wouldn't it be awful if religion does something to you that boxes you in and hinders you from finding him. W wouldn't it be awful if the very fact of religion itself is a hindrance to the discovery of the fact that, uh, of the very fact of re what religion is focused on? Him. Wouldn't it be interesting if the traditions, the activities, the theology, what you've been taught becomes some kind of a barrier to the reality of who he really is? That breaks my heart. Wouldn't it be awful if the very thing you've been taught in your life becomes the very thing that keeps you from the discovery of the reality of his person? Don't be like them. They're the only group. See, in their mind, there is an arrival. In their mind, there is, I got it. In their mind, there is, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. In their mind, they're superior. In their mind, they've somehow crawled out of need. There's no openness in them. And somehow, in their religious platform and context, there is some kind of some kind of element that's eaten into the very soul of their lives and the openness and the seeking and the drive to find him. They use the words, but there is no seeking. Now, there is a contrast in, in, in the passage between the seeking of the wise men and the seeking of Herod. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit. It's interesting that in the passage, you could make a case for the same passion that the wise men had for the Christ child is the same passion that Herod has for the Christ child. In other words, Herod wants to find the Christ child as bad as the wise men do. I mean, the wise men have set everything aside to find him. Herod is willing to go to any extent to locate him. See, both of them are seeking See, the wise men are giving financial uh, sacrifice, making financial sacrifice. The wise men are, are, uh, have left family and home. The wise, men, the wise men have traveled for two years. The wise men, they, they've been going at this thing diligently. Oh, Herod, he's going at this thing diligently. He will not back off. He's willing to sacrifice anything, everything. He's willing to kill baby boys. He's willing to do anything he needs to do to find the Christ child. 
both of them are seeking. But at the heart of the seeking of Herod, as you look at the passage, there is a, it's the same intensity, it's the same passion, but at the heart of the seeking of Herod, there is this, there is this, what would you call it? There's this deception. It's not, it's not real. It's not, it's, oh, look at the passage, verse 7. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, go and search carefully for the young child. All of this is a lie. Hey, find him, come back and tell me, I want to worship him too. But see, it's all deceptive. It's a lie. At the heart of his seeking is this overwhelming lie. Now, you realize that's going to be exposed. Because if you're seeking with a lie at the heart of it, that thing is going to be made known. For instance, it's going to be made known by the angel. The angel of the Lord is going to show up. For instance, if you look at verse 13, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream in verse 13 and said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. See, the angel knows, God knows, See, at the core of seeking, there is a God who understands what drives you in your seeking. He knows the deception of the human heart. See, you cannot hide it from him. There is no question about that. It's interesting, in the book of Hebrews, he talks about this phenomenal rest thing that we can get into, and he calls us to rest in the Word of God. And he says this about the Word of God. Listen to these words. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I was talking about the Word of God. <gasps> you mean the Bible? Well, but the next verse, listen to this. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Like we've moved from a book to a person, which would be Jesus himself. And did you get the statement? There is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked, open to the eyes of him to whom we will give an account. See, he knows. Come on, you know this, don't you? There is nothing hidden from... You can't con him. That's ridiculous to even try. To con the divine who knows everything that's going on in your... To tell God one thing when you're really thinking another thing and think he doesn't know? <laughs> Come on, that's the height of stupidity, gentlemen and ladies. Wow. For God absolutely knows, and Herod, you're not going to get by, for at the core of your seeking, there is a deception that is going to be revealed. But it's not only revealed by the angel, it's revealed by his attitude. Did you see down in verse 16? Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. So Herod literally flipped out. Why did he get so mad? He got mad because those wise men, I told them, come back and tell me when you find the Christ child. Come back and tell me where he is so I can worship him too. And they promised me they would, and they did not. They deceived me. They went home another way. And he is madder than a hornet over being deceived when he is the one who is deceiving. Isn't it interesting that when we see our sin in somebody else, it just ticks us off? When somebody does to us what we do to everybody else, we just don't like it. <laughs> when you lie to me, I just hate it, but I can lie to you and it's okay. But the attitude in relationships that literally spills out will reveal. How do I say this to you? 
that when what you experience in your relational attitudes is a revelation of what you are in your inner heart. Wow. That's a raw statement, isn't it? What you are in your relationships, what you express, the attitude you have in your relationships with each other is an exposure of what you are in your inner heart. What, what ticks you off? What makes you mad? Wow. It's revealed by an angel of the Lord in verse 13. It's revealed by his anger in verse 16. It's revealed by his action. For what he did out of that was he sent and put to death, according to verse 16, uh, put to, sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all of its districts from two years old and under. So his actions literally reveal his deception. If you'd have gone to Herod back at the beginning of this passage, and you'd have said to Herod, you're going to end up killing baby boys, he would have no doubt looked you in the eye and said, no way I'm going to do that. But isn't it interesting? Deception at the heart will take you where you never thought you would go and will cause you to do what you never dreamed you'd do. And it reveals itself. Deception. Now, what I want to talk to you about this morning is in Herod's deceptive seeking, there are some elements. And I want to search through my own life and see if these elements are present. The first element that you see is the element of hiding. You will note in verse 7, then Herod, when he, would, when he had secretly called the wise men. Now, we don't know for sure what that really meant. Obviously, it means something of a private meeting with the, with the wise men. In other words, this was not a public meeting. This was not with lots of people there. This was just the wise men and Herod, and he secretly called them together, and he interrogated them for, for uh, uh, quite some time until they revealed when the star appeared. So Herod is literally, literally hiding his deception. He's hiding what he's really thinking. He's hiding what he really wants to do. He cannot reveal it. If it's revealed, he'll be in trouble. So he's hiding what he really wants to do, hiding what he really feels, hiding what he really wants to do, camouflages it. See, deception is always a process of hiding. I thought it was so interesting in the Scriptures that sin is always talked about in terms of darkness. Righteousness is talked about in terms of light. And the imagery is light is exposing, light is revealing, light is openness, light is seeing, darkness is camouflage, darkness is hiding, darkness is secretly. Isn't it interesting that looting and, and the cities and the rioting takes place in the darkness, not in the daylight. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? See, do, doesn't that tell you something about the inner heart? Isn't it interesting? We have to light the place up at night to keep crime down. Why? Because this whole business of evil and sin is all confined in hiding and deception and doesn't that tell you what you don't want to be in? Doesn't that tell you what your heart must not, must not align itself with? Doesn't that tell you that, oh, there must be an openness. There must come an openness in my life. There must be a, a revealing. There must be an exposing of the depth of who I am that I must live in the let everyone know. <sighs> what do you want to do with that? The hiding idea is really strong in the passage itself. 
The opposite of seeking is not not seeking. Well, I'm not seeking, therefore I'm not seeking. That's not true. Seeking, not seeking. They're not, those aren't, aren't opposites. The opposite of seeking is deception. So in the passage, Herod, who is filled with deception, is really, it's not that he's just not seeking. He is seeking, but it's a deceptive seeking. There is no openness. There is no, hey, if God has brought to the world a new king, I want in on this. There is no openness. There is deception. There is closed down. There is That is the biggest obstacle you have in your life. I have in my life. See, to get on your knees and to admit, I have a problem. You know how hard that is? I've been wrong. You know how difficult that is? See, that's the grind of hiding and deception. Now, there's another element in this whole business, and of course, it's the element of the heart, and you would understand us to go there. Because when you come to Herod's, uh, to the passage in Herod, then when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined... Now, that word determined, is the, uh, it's only used twice in the whole New Testament and is used o- only here in this passage here and, and in one other place in, in, in connection with this story. So Matthew is taking this term that's not used anyplace else in the New Testament and he's focused it entirely on the wise men and especially Herod and labels Herod with this word. And this word has to do with interrogation. This word has to do with, with, a, a, with the determining facts, gaining information. It has to do with finding out. So here's Herod, who at the core of his being is deceived, and he's literally spreading this deception into the lives of the wise men and pulling them into his deceptive action and manners. So it's a matter of what's going on in the deep internal motive of Herod himself. Deception is always a matter of the heart. How honest can I be with you about this? A homosexual says, well, I was born that way. That's deceptive. Because homosexuality, any sexuality, is an issue of the heart. Well, I'm an alcoholic and it's a disease. No, it's an issue of the heart. There's a condition in the heart that's not right. Now, we don't have time to list every sin that you can think of But if you list any sin you want to name and trace it down to the cause of that, you'll find the cause is not, well, I was born that way. Well, that's the way I was trained. Well, that's the way I, well, that's the way we do it in the South. Or that's, see, that's my culture or whatever. You cannot go there, man, because it is a, it's not, well, hey, I was abused as a child. And all the excuses that we use in the past, you, you can use them all, but it's deceptive because it really is a condition of the inner heart. And there is a cure for the inner heart. <laughs> and it's this, it's this Jesus that we're seeking. He is the cure for the desperate need of the inner heart. And we've described this so many times to you that sin cannot be, dis- cannot be defined by the action of the deed. It's not the action of the deed that makes a thing a sin. It just isn't, folks. Well, that's bad because he did this. No. He, see, he did this because he has a condition in his heart. And it isn't the action of the deed. It's this inner heart thing. 
So all sins are on the same plane. So it's not this is a good sin and this is a bad sin. There aren't any good sins. <laughs> See, it isn't worse to steal 10, uh, to knock over a bank than it is to steal 10 cents. Why? Because stealing is stealing because it's an issue of the heart. And stealing it isn't any worse than lying. Why? Because it's an issue of the heart. So all sin comes back to the condition of the inner heart. And, and Herod is full of this deception in the inner heart that is literally destroying him and will destroy him for it will bring him to death. There's a third element. There's the element of the hiding which Herod is right in the middle of in the secret thing in verse 7. There's the element of the heart because it's a condition of his inner heart, no question about that, and he's hiding it. And then there's the hostile forces. It's interesting that in the passage, and this is so, I really struggled with this message because, see, this is Christmas Sunday. <laughs> see, we should be talking about skies are filled with angels, and we should be talking about, oh, look at the Christ child in the manger, and we should be singing like shepherds, and we should, you know, this is a gifts, and this is merriment, and this is party, and this is woo. And this is so negative. And yet, it is, isn't it interesting that in the midst of a star appearing and the great move of an almighty God to redeem a world, there's this whole undercurrent that's going on in the story. And it's very, very negative. In other words, you see two distinct actions taking place. You see God and love and passion and wise men seeking and hearts that are open and, and our world is being redeemed and lives are being changed. And over here you see deception and baby boys dying and moms and dads crying. And you see there's these two elements that literally are presented to you in the passage, and they are awful elements. The one is, anyway. And it's very, very negative, but it's right in the middle of the Christmas story. That battle is going on in your life. You live in that scene. There is a star that has appeared in your life. The Christ has reached out to you. There is a drawing that's going on in your inner heart. There is all that he is in redemption that is literally being handed to you. It is a phenomenal, overwhelming moment. At the same time, there is the deception, there is the demonic, there is the war, there is the spiritual animosity, there is the hatred, there is the bitterness, there is the cover, there is the hide, there is all of that that's going on at the same time, man, and it's playing itself out in your life. Well, the devil is bigger than I am. That is true. But here's the interesting thing. The devil, according to the scriptures, has been totally, absolutely defeated. Not going to be, is. Now, that all took place uh, I picture this in the language of my childhood uh, where I was raised in the culture that I was raised in. We talked about hogtide. I don't know if you know what that is. Hogtide was, you were made absolutely helpless when they got done with you. you. You couldn't move. So I would like to propose to you today that the devil is totally, absolutely hogtied. He can't lift a finger against you. He has no power against you. He has no way to get to you. He can have no influence on you. He has no ability to stop you. He is totally, absolutely helpless. 
the only thing he's got is his big mouth. He can lie to you. And if you buy into the lie, So it is an issue, the spiritual war of your life, the battle that's raging in the passage and in our lives is the battle of truth and deception. Will you live in the wise men? Or will you live in the Herod? Will you be a seeker? Or will you be a deceiver? The only thing the devil can do to you is lie to you. And if you buy into the lie, you know what Jesus said about him? Listen to this. You are of your father, the devil. The desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. You know what he's saying? He's saying when the devil wants to talk, you know what he does? He goes to his resources. Here's the pile of resource right here. Here's everything the devil knows. Here's all that the devil operates in. And when he dips into his pile of resource and he hands it to you, you know what he's going to hand you? A lie. Why? Because that's all he's got in his pile. <laughs> so how do you know the devil's lying? He opened his mouth. And when you buy into the lie, well, I'm trapped. No, you're not. You're not trapped. Well, I've got this message, I'm trapped. It's a lie. You are not trapped. No, I'm locked down. No, you're not. You're not. I can't get out of this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Well, no, I'm, 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 I'm in prison. I'm, I'm, I'm locked down. I'm, uh, the door is shut. The, Take your foot and kick the door. It's not locked. I'm telling you, he's lying to you. He's absolutely lying to you. You are not trapped. You are not in bondage. You are not. It's a lie, man. It's an absolute lie from the devil. And if you would seek, if you would be open, if you would... See, that's the message, man. Well, mainly, how can I get out of deception? How can I get out of this lie? Seek. Seeking is kicking the door open. Seeking is discovering, I was told a lie. And it's not the truth. Would you seek? Jesus, here we are in your presence. On Christmas Sunday, Wow, you have come. The wonder of God has split the sky wide open and revelation has taken place and we have literally been brought into the truth of who you are. And we have the opportunity this morning to get on camels and travel and hunt you down but even as I speak that, I know the truth that you really have come after us and we don't have to go any place because you're banging on our heart's door and you are seeking us. And if we were to respond in openness, all the deception that has ever entered into our lives could be melted away. We could discover the light in the midst of our darkness. So Jesus, I'm crying out to you today for a revelation of yourself at this special time of year, for you to be birthed within us that we might see you. And those of us who have been influenced by tradition and, and, and the heritage of church and, and all the stuff that is a part of religion, oh God, don't let us get bogged down. Don't let us get sidetracked off of you. Don't bring us back to the, to the central issue of, of your personhood and the embracing of who you are. Tune our ears today to your voice that we might hear you.
Heads are bowed. I want, to, I want you to think about the, what you've been told, the lie that he has spoken to you. I want you to think about the inability for change within you that he has proposed. I want you to think about the lie that you are stuck. Things can't be different. I want you to think about the lie that you've gone too far. You've done too much. I want you to think about the lie that, yeah, others can, but it's not for me. It is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. Would you seek? Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be open. Wouldn't it be something if there's only one thing God wants out of you today or any day, and it's an open heart Seeking Him. Our altar's open. It's for seekers with open hearts. There's no pressure. You don't have to kneel. You don't have to seek. You can stay trapped. You can live the lie. But this is Christmas. He has come. This is for you. Want to join me in seeking Him today?